Good morning, everyone. How's everyone? So congratulations, you made it to the final lecture. Um, so today we're going to finish the topic on applications from last time and also briefly cover some advanced topics and optimization. So first of all, are there any questions from, from last time? This is your last chance to, to ask questions and get credit. Okay. So about applications, last time we talked about neural networks for speech. This time we'll start by talking about neural networks for computer vision, okay? So following this paper by Kwok Lei et al. So the motivating question that um, this group, uh, Stanford Google group had was, is it possible to learn very high level features such as face detectors? from unlabeled data. And this goes back to our original motivation of deep learning. Is it possible to learn these very kind of high level features, right? So think about a face, that's a very high level feature. If you give the input and it can automatically have a feature of a face, that's very high level, okay? And the answer is yes. If you use a extremely big and deep network of one billion parameters and train it on 10 million images from YouTube, and if you have 1,000 machines for a week, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's a, this is a very impressive paper in that they show that if you scale to extremely large data sets using extremely strong computation power, you can actually achieve a lot. And actually, that's one of the reasons that deep learning is coming back now, is now we have big data, now we have cheap computation. Right. So maybe at the university we can't have 1,000 machines, but maybe we can have 100 machines and you can still do something interesting. Okay. Yeah. So high level features, so I'm using the word high level features sort of in a fuzzy sense. So I'm not really defining what exactly is a high level feature, but you can think of it as something that's very abstract, something that is um, sort of semantically meaningful. So from for the image perspective, it's something that's very far away from the pixel. Okay. okay, so let's talk about how they do it. Um, before, basically, this idea of high-level features, you can think, so I, I don't talk about neuroscience in this class much because although deep learning takes some inspiration from neuroscience, there's actually some disconnect. But in the field of computer vision, they actually have a lot of cross collaboration. So there's this hypothesis, it's actually kind of controversial and not, m most people don't believe it. Uh, but it's an interesting hypothesis saying that we might have a grandmother cell that says, it's a cell that lights up when you see your grandmother, right? So maybe you hear your grandmother, you see the picture of your grandmother and that single cell will light up, right? So Basically, um, it's the idea that maybe in the brain, there's these high level um, components that understand something, right? So maybe you have another cell for, for recognizing your teacher or another cell for recognizing um, your father or something like that. I mean, most people think now there's actually multiple cells being activated when you see the screen. But for, for our purposes, basically, we want to see if we implement in the neural network, can we get something like a grandmother self? Okay, and if you think of babies learning to recognize the face of the mother, right, that's actually very impressive, right? Somehow the baby can figure out um, that it's mother and it's not just a, some stranger. Okay. All right, so that's the motivation. So um, before I talk about this paper, I need to talk about the previous work in computer vision. And um, I guess most of you don't work on computer vision, so, so I'll go through this sort of very um, succinctly. So in computer vision, actually, um, Yang Li Kun and a couple of folks have been using neural networks for a long time. So even though last time I said the history was that neural networks fell out of favor since the SVMs came along, but these guys actually kept on working on it. They actually had state-of-the-art results for digit recognition for a long time. And they use something called convolutional nets. And it's basically based on two ideas. 
first is the idea of receptive fields. So receptive field means that each hidden node has a, recept a small receptive field. And it means that this hidden node is only connected to a few of the underlying pixels. Okay. So for example, here H has a receptive field of three nodes. So it only connects to three pixels underlying. H2 only connects to three pixels. H3 only connects to these three pixels, okay? So you can think of it as maybe in your, your, your brain, what, what goes to your retina has some receptive field and um, each neuron in the back of the, the eye doesn't connect to every single point on your retina, but actually connects to only a small subplot. So, so that's the idea of um, receptive field. And um, when you have convolutional nets, basically what you do is you assume that these weights are tied, meaning that these weights are the same, okay? So basically you're saying that this weight, this weight, and this weight are the same. This weight, this weight, this weight are the same, and this weight, this weight, and this weight are the same, okay? So when you have that, it's called convolution because you can think of it as you have a filter that you convolve over the image. Right? So if you know signal processing, that's exactly what's a convolution operation. But um, for our purposes, you can think of basically each of this um, local receptive field can be some sort of local filter. So maybe this one would detect uh, edge like this, and this one would detect the same edge like this, but at a different position in the image, okay? So that's the idea of local receptive fields. And after local receptive fields, you have something called the pooling layer. So these are these P units. And here, in this case, the weights are actually not learned. The weights are set, okay? And there's many ways to do pooling. Pooling just means you take things together, right? So one way to pull is to say, I just take the max. So one is to define P as the max of whatever goes underneath. Okay, so you can say P1 is the max of this two value. Or you can take the L2 max. So basically you square it and then sum it. Okay. The idea is that basically you collect the weights into, you kind of subsample whatever is measured here into something that's um, a smaller size, okay. So there's several advantages of this kind of receptive field and pooling architecture. The first one is that there's way fewer weights, right? So you don't have a full connection and you also have tied weights. So you have way fewer parameters, which means that it's easier to train, right? So it's, it's not as likely to overfit the training data. And actually when you do back propagation, because there's fewer weights to go through, the vanishing gradient problem is less severe. So that's one motivation is computational and um, for generalization. A second advantage is shift invariance. So by shift invariance, I mean that you are robust to shift in the image. So for example, suppose we have an image. Suppose this is a one dimensional image and it has an edge at x2, right? And suppose um, this will try to learn to detect some sort of edge. Okay, so if it has an edge at x2, that basically means that x1 has a high value, x2 has a lower value, and x3 has a low value, right? Then you have an edge, right? So suppose you have an edge like that. Now to detect that, basically what you want is this will be a high weight and these two will be low weight, right? Then you can have this be on, be high. So if you have an edge at two, you can capture that with this kind of weight, but what if that edge shifts, right? So say your camera shifts a little bit, the edge actually goes to four, but it's the same edge, right? But since you're, you're using the same filter here, in that case, you will still get this be on, right? Let's say that the edge moved very, uh, just a little bit, right? So it moved from H, X2 to X3, right? 
So basically what happens is that rather than H1 being on, now you have the H2 being on. But because of pooling, you're taking the max of them, either one of them being on is fine. So in essence, it's shift invariant. If you shift one pixel in this case, you'll get this be on no matter what. Now if you shift too far, then of course you get a different result. But for regional shifts, it's robust to that. Okay. So this is a very smart way to sort of encode what you know about image. Right? So we know in the image, local pixels are correlated. So we, we should model that. But faraway pixels are not, so we don't model that. So the connections only need to be local. Right? And we also know that in the local region, slight changes, slight shifts doesn't matter. So, so then we have this pooling layer to say, OK, either one can be on. It doesn't matter. So we pull them together. Okay. So that's the idea of convolutional net. Or, uh, yeah. Are there any questions? So the question is, if you only depend on local area, you lose global information, right? But basically, you're encoding that. You're saying that the, from the computer vision perspective, it's the local things that matter. But you will have many layers, right? So the first layer will just look at this maybe local three pixels. But you can have another set of layers up here, and that will connect to three nodes here. And by connecting to three nodes here, you're actually looking at a larger region, right? So it's hierarchical in that sense. So you can get global information once you go to the top of the deep network. If you think that um, we're trying to solve the object recognition problem in images, so this is a reasonable um, way to encode things. Now, if you want to solve something where actually the relationship between things matter a lot, then maybe you do not want a convolutional net. Maybe you do want to let the weights be three, and then you should have more connections. But that's reasonable. Okay. Did you have a question? That's a good question. So, so um, by scale invariant, basically you mean that, say, say before the edge was only one pixel wide. Now you're going to have two pixel wide, right? And basically, both of them will will matter. Will will not will not will get the same output here, right? So, um, I think it's not as good doing scale invariance. I'm not really sure. Um, we'll later talk about another way to do. Um, this kind of thing that's actually scale invariant as well. I think it's somewhat robust to scale invariant, but um, later we'll see something that's stronger. That's a good question. Okay, so basically you can think of, this is actually what's done in practice in convolutional nets. So you can think of this as one map. People call this a map. So. It's, a, it's one filter, so it's one map. And, and here you have four maps. So you actually have, you can think of it as 3D. So you have more, more hidden nodes because all these weights are tied, so you have different kinds of weights. Okay. So you have, first level you have, for, for each 2D part, you have a receptive field and you have multiple maps. Okay. And then from these multiple maps, which are the H's, then you pull them together. And then you take these maps again, and then you, you do the convolution on top of them. And you could have different number of maps as well. And then you pull them together. And then finally, in the end, you have a standard two-layer network. So that's what's done in practice. Okay. All right. 
So now let's talk about yes. So it's there. So, ここの map の意味は、だ今ここ weight 全部同じだから、この h は下一つ h だけ、一つ orientation の h だけ学習して。例えばさっき言ったのもこういう h を学習して。でももしこういう h じゃなくて、まあこういう h を学習したいときは、別の weight が入れる。そしたらまあもう一つ h を作って。そこでもう一つマップという。OK。OK。So now let's talk about the architecture proposed by、um, Cropleg and all. So it looks a bit complicated at first, but it's very sim similar ideas from the convolution nets. OK。So first of all, their image input is a 200 by 200 pixel、um, image.、Okay. And in this picture, They don't draw things in 2D because they just draw things in 1D. It's simpler to draw. Okay, so you can think of it says 200 here, but actually it's 200 times 200. Everything is sort of multiplied like that. Okay, it's a color image, so you have three input channels here. Okay, and the receptive field size is 18 by 18 pixels. So you can think of you place a for each of these channels. You place a grid of 18 by 18 over the pixels, and then you you slide it across there, and that will give you about 180、um, hidden nodes up here, right? So about 180 hidden nodes, and they actually have eight maps, so that will be times eight here. And the pooling is five by five, so for each of these. They'll take five of them and then they'll pool them together, and they do the L2 pooling. And after they pool things together, they do some sort of normalization. It turns out to be important.、Um, it's called local contrast normalization. You can think of it as、um, you subtract the the mean of the neighbors just to make sure that everything is sort of balanced,、okay. and then you get the final output. And then you repeat this thing. Three times, okay. And the weights that are learned are these W, so you can think of it as、um, a three-layer architecture, although there's these sort of fixed layers、um, in the middle. So there are actually nine sets of weights, but we're, we're trying to learn three three sets. Okay. Okay. Does this architecture make sense? So basically, it's receptive field pooling normalization, receptive field pooling normalization again here. Okay. Okay. So, how do they train this? They optimize this kind of objective. So, for each image x n coming in, first of all, there's an auto encoder error. So. You encode it using this W, so now I'm writing it as W E, and then you decode it back, and you want to make sure that it's the same image. Okay, so this is the auto encoder part, and then for the pooling part,、um, it looks like this. So X times W E is the the output here at H.、Um, And then this PK you can think of it as just a pooling unit. So it's a receptive field. So you can it, it's sort of uniform weights, but some of them are zero, right? So each unit here, PK here,、um, takes five of these pixels down here and simply takes the average, the L2 average. So it squares the squares the input value, and then sums it together using this PK function. L2. This is just to make sure that things are not zero. It's a small number. Okay. Okay. So basically, this first term tries to do auto encoding, and the second term will try to do pooling. Okay. And I'll later explain why they are useful. Okay. So, 
So this kind of formulation is, is very similar to something called topographic ICA. Um, do people do know independent component analysis? Okay. You can think of it as um, a way to sort of decompose your data to multiple independent factors. So, so it's basically the same thing as what we're trying to learn each layer is we want to decompose the data into multiple independent factors. But what's different is that this idea of topography being that whatever features you learn, you assume there's some relationship between the features, okay? So, so this picture will make it clear. Um, suppose you learn a bunch of edge features, okay? So these are the edges. Can you see this, okay? So for example, an edge like this, edge like this, okay? And actually, although there's many ways to draw an edge, right? The, these edges actually have some similarity. So for example, all the edges here are slanted in this direction. And maybe all the edges here are slanted in this direction, okay? So what this idea tries to do is that we want to make sure to, that similar, similar edges are sort of grouped close together in this space, okay? So you can define saying that, okay, I learned uh, 100 hidden features using ICA or using whatever method. And you want to make sure that each successive 10 of those features are correlated in some way, okay? So in order to, to make sure that these things are related, one, one easy way to achieve that is through pooling, right? So this is doing L2 pooling. So basically we sum each element. So say we have a, take a three by three grid, and then we sum each of these elements, and then, sorry, square each of these elements and sum them together, right? So that's basically this term here, right? We take each of the elements, square them, and then sum them together, right? And after we sum them together, basically we try to minimize this term. Now, if we minimize this term over all data sets, all data points, basically that will mean that um, you will want the, the correlation to be small over here, so because you're trying to minimize it. So the effect of this term here basically will ensure that whatever features you learn, so you can think of, you can put each of these features in any place you want. Okay, so maybe you can learn these features and you can place it here, you can place it here. These are all just different maps, okay? But now you're saying that you want nearby maps to be similar, right? So it'll place all the features like this in the same area and all the features like this in the same area, okay? So it sort of achieves this kind of grouping property. And here it comes this, so because we're, we're trying to say that they're, they're similar, so you actually achieve not only shift invariance, but scale and rotation invariance in this case. So you can think of, say, say you train this well. What happens is, say you have an image that has a edge like this versus an edge like this. So it's very similar. What will happen is that it will activate around the same region. And after pooling, they will have the same effect, right? So whether you have this one or this one, it doesn't matter, okay? So then that's a scale, scale uh, and rotation invariance in this case, okay? Does this make sense? Okay. I think it takes a while to, to sink in, but the basic idea is that by putting similar looking features together and making sure that they pull together and making sure that you minimize the output of the pooling, then basically um, you will try to ensure that features that are similar are grouped together, okay? And if you have a very different feature, right? 
in that case, it'll go to a different part. So for example, this part and this part is very different. So in your image, if you have this part, it will activate something here. If you have this part, it will activate something here, and they are different in, they are different features. Okay. So, so does that make sense? But anyways, um, you can look at this paper more if you want to, to know more details. But it's actually a very, very smart way to, to learn features. So basically, this you can think of this equation as an efficient solution for this kind of um, problem. So actually, this idea came from um, Alpo Piper and his paper, Topographic ICA. And to actually do this, um, they do some sort of ICA-like kind of computation, which turns out to be very expensive. And basically, what Klaus Leib did in the previous paper is to show that you don't need to do something as complicated like uh, ICA. But if you have this term here, actually it will give something that's very similar. And he shows some equivalence. And he calls this a reconstructed reconstruction topographic ICA. Okay. So I mean that's kind of a detail. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, but uh, just to summarize, you can think of it as we're, we're trying to learn these weights, okay? And these weights, these weights will be adjusted so that things close together here will be active if, if they're actually important things we want to learn, okay? Okay, so now let's see how they do it. Um, so basically, uh, they, they use three layer, so they repeat that layer for three times. That's a lot of parameters. It's the largest neural network in the world probably, uh, I mean certainly. Um, and they sampled YouTube videos, so 10 million YouTube videos, each video they pick one image out of them. And there's a lot of tricks for how to parallelize the data in the model. So I'll talk about it later today. So here's the result. So um, earlier we talked about uh, grandmother neuron, right? So do they actually learn a grandmother neuron? So this is a face neuron that they've learned. Basically, they have, I'm not sure how many features they have on the top layer, um, but um, I think maybe a thousand or a little bit less than that. So basically they look through each of those highest level neurons, so basically these guys after three layers. Okay, so they probe each one of them and see, okay, this one gets activated when I put what kind of image in it. So they found one neuron there that always gets activated when you put a face image to it. Okay. So, so that means it's actually a very high level feature. Whenever you put a face to it, this neuron activates. They can actually try to simulate what's the best image that will give this neuron the highest activation, and that turns out to be a face, right? So it's kind of a scary looking face, but this is sort of the most um, canonical image that will activate that neuron. So you can see clearly it's a face. Okay. Now, now there's another neuron that they learned, um, which is cat, right? So another neuron will fire whenever you give an image of a cat, and this is the the prototypical, the most canonical image that will activate. And you can see there's a cat, right? Okay. And here are more examples. So different different neurons being activated by different things. Okay. So you can see that there's some some regularity in there. So for example, I mean these are all sort of small circular things. These are sort of cylindrical things. 
here you have circular, right, circular things. Some are kind of funny, right? I don't know why. But so these are basically taking the, the top images in the data set that activate that neuron. And so you have a flower one, sort of lake and duck one, and, and pizza. Apparently there's lots of pizza pictures on YouTube. So the important thing to know is that all of this is learned in an unsupervised fashion. So they only give it pictures. They don't say this picture is a pizza. They don't say this picture is a face. So everything is unsupervised. And they managed to learn this kind of thing. And so this, this paper generated a lot of excitement because they, they showed that it's possible to learn this kind of high level feature. So what if you actually use this high level feature and apply it to some computer vision task of classification? So this is what they did is after they trained um, this deep network, they add a logistic regression on top as the final layer, and then use some supervised learning on some standard data set. Okay. And this image in that data set has many categories. So about 20,000 categories of images. This is some example. It's actually very hard, right? Do you know this is a leopard, not a cheetah? Okay. So that's a very hard thing, right? This is a motor scooter, right? You have to figure out this is a container ship, right? So it's actually a, not, not just any ship, but a container ship. So this is a very hard task. Um, if you classify things randomly, you have less than 1% accuracy. The previous state of art is about 9% accuracy. And basically, they totally beat in previous results. So without pre-training and just using the deep network directly on the image net, supervised data set using backpropagation, they can get about 13%. And using the entire YouTube data for pre-training, they could get 15% for precision. So this is the state of their art results um, at 2012. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure how long it take, took the previous state of the art. I mean, they probably didn't have 1,000 machines for a week. So yeah, in, in a sense, and they probably don't have the entire YouTube data. So in a sense, it's not a fair comparison. Right? These guys are using more resources. But these resources are unlabeled resources. Right? So that's sort of things you get for free. Right? Yeah, but that's a good point. Like if you put in more resources, of course you ought to win. Okay. All right, so that's all I have about computer vision application. Are there questions? Hey. Training what? On the Saki Yuta, on the YouTube data, Mazono, Koyumono Gachi Sta data, oh, pre training, like put them to pre training, you know, unsupervised data at the Gala. Now, so they all got the feature to stay logistic regression to you. So they got pre training and so forth. The pre training, Nai Ho, what? You know, YouTube data, Skala Nakte, and took us it to. Supervised model. But Kore Mizu to Jitsua pre training no Koka wa ma ni percent to gurai de ma hoga no deep architecture no Koka no hoga o i janai ka tomo ieri. So it's not.
So now let's talk about the final application, which is recurrent neural networks, um, neural network language models. Okay, so this is a language application. So the goal of language modeling, um, you can think of it as you want to give the probability to a word sequence or a sentence. So for example, you have a likely sentence that happens that's recognized speech, right? So this guy should have a high probability. This sentence should have a high probability. So if you have a sentence like this that's recognized speech, that's probably not a very likely sentence. So you wanted to give it a low probability. So a language model is basically a probabilistic model that will assign probability values to sentences or to words. Okay. And it's very useful for many applications. Okay. So one standard way to do it is what's called a n-gram model. Right? So suppose now you have four words in your sentence. You want to find what's the probability of this four-word sentence. You can decompose this to um, sequences of two words. Right? So what's the probability of the fourth word given the third word? What's the probability of third word given the second word? Second word given the first word, and what's the probability of the first word? You can, you can define it like this, and then you can, on data, on large amounts of data, you can calculate, okay, what's this probability? Okay. So you can get that from any unlabeled text you collect, and you can say, okay, this probability is simply equal to how many times these two words occur together divided by how many times the first word occurs, okay? So this is one way to get this probability, and from multiplying all these probabilities, you can get the probability of the sentence, okay? And you can have long, longer n-grams. So a trigram will say that we want to predict the fourth word given the third and second word, predict the third word given, given the second and third word, okay? So, Basically, our goal is to say, okay, given some past sequence of words, what's the most likely ne next word? That's the goal of language model. Does that make sense? I'm going, kind of going through this very fast. But. Okay, so how do you do language modeling with a neural network? Um, one way to do it is with a recurrent neural network. And by recurrent, I mean that actually there's a feedback loop in the system. And I'm introducing this kind of neural network because um, it's not just useful for language data, but people have used it for any time series model. So this kind of recurrent feedback is very useful for, for any sort of time series data. So like stock forecasting, weather forecasting. Okay. okay, so this is the architecture, a very simplified architecture. So let's say we want to model what's the probability of the current word given all the previous words that we've seen. Okay, this is what we want to model using a neural network. And for now, let's just do assume that we have three words in our vocabulary, okay? So, so you only use three words when you talk, okay? So those words are Y1, Y2, and Y3, okay? So this neural network, when Y1 is on, that basically says you, you use the word Y1. When Y2 is on, you use the word Y2, okay? And this is sort of a probability distribution. Okay. So you will predict, so you think of this is the next word, and you will predict the next word based on some hidden states, okay? So these H's will tell you what's the most likely next word. And they, the form of it is this. So basically, you sum everything together to get the value here, and then you normalize it with the exponential. This is called the softmax. So we only talk about logistic functions here um, for binary variables. But the softmax is something that's very useful if you have a multinomial variable that you want to model. Okay. So basically, you're just normalizing across these outputs so you can get probabilities at y k. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so if you just want to predict the word, you choose which node has the biggest value. If you actually want the probability of that word, 
then you will normalize, take this normalize. Yeah, so normally you want to know the probability of that wave, not just what's the most likely wave. Okay. Yeah. So I think, think you're doing a speech recognizer or tra a machine translator. You actually care about the probability of that. <coughs> okay. Okay, so, so I said the probability of the, the word is predicted based on what's the hidden state. Now how do you predict the hidden state? The hidden state is predicted based on the previous word. Okay. So this is the previous word here. Um, and it's also predicted based on the previous state. Okay. So here you see the feedback loop where to predict this current state, you would use the value of the previous state. Right? So basically, as you go through the sentence, each time after you predict this, you will put it back as an input for the next iteration. Okay. Now for this previous word, how is it encoded? Basically, um, you just set it to be one for whatever word you actually observe, and then set it to be zero for other words. Okay. And each of these are, are sort of logistic function, like usual. So we can see an example. So for example, you have the sentence, he loves her. So these are the three words you can only say. He loves her. Okay, and um, let's say we, we've observed the word he and loves and we want to know what's the probability of the next word. So basically what happens is um, we're going to serve this hidden state here depends on the previous, previous words and the previous, previous hidden state, right? So we're going to sort of copy this part and write it down here. So you get something like this, okay? So basically, the probability out here of her depends, uh, is a deep network like this, right? So first of all, you observe the word he, okay? And let's suppose he is encoded as the second node, so x2. So let's assume that he is x2, loves is x1, and her is x3, okay? So in this case, first of all, you set x2 to be one, these to be zero, and these are some initial h. Could be something random or some something you actually learn to be the initial probability of h. So given this feature, you can compute the hidden state here, right? So this is the the hidden state that you use as input to the curve. And then you observe the word loves, and you set this to be one, so then you can compute this hidden state. Right? And then after that, finally, you can compute this. And you can think of, if you have a, a very long sentence, you just keep on going, right? So, so you have a very long sentence, you just keep on storing the hidden state of the previous one, and then concatenating it with the, the word you've seen, and that can predict the the following word. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what happens on the representation of word? It doesn't matter, right? So say he loves, loves her, right? Basically, you just, uh, the word input here occurs again. So, so it doesn't matter for the framework. So it's like the Gakshusu Toki wa her ga takaku naru yo ni gakshusu. Ma demi ma wa tada sono tsugi no her no kakuritsu wa nan desu ka te kite te. Hai, hai. Yeah, so actually, so questions about training. So training is actually very simple, right? You can think of it as you observe your training data 
is actually your, your sentence. So first of all, you observe the word he, and then observe the word loves. And from he, you want to predict love, right? So loves is your output in the first time step. Second time step, you already observe loves, and you want to predict her. So that's your training data in your, your second time step. So you can keep up. Basically, you're using the, the input time sequence as both the input and as the output. Okay. And when you want to train it, basically, at each point, you unroll the network, and then you can do back propagation. Okay, so it's, this, it's called back propagation through time because you're kind of going back through time. Yes? Yes. So, so in practice, in the language modeling case, maybe you have 10,000 words here, right. right? So this is a 10,000 long vector, and maybe we have 100 hidden states, okay? So it's very large. So the input being large is no problem. Actually, what's the problem with the output being large? So that when you want to compute the normalization, right, you need to sum over 10,000 things, right? and that's computationally expensive. So there are ways, tricks to make that part fast. Yeah, so the input is, is, is big. The output people do some clustering of words, actually, to make it small. Yeah. Yeah, so I can, I can talk to you later more in detail if you want to know. But w let's just assume we have a small PM. Yeah, so there's, for any neural network, right, there's always a problem if you have very large output space um, or very large input space. There's some um, optimization you might need to do to make sure it's computable. Okay. All right. But basically, you can think of training is, is simply um, doing back propagation through this unrolled network. The only problem is you can think of it's a very deep network, right? So if you have a 10 word sentence, you have sort of 10 layers going back, right? If you have a 20 word sentence, you have 20 layers going back, and that becomes very deep. So basically, it has the same vanishing gradients problem as before, although people have successfully trained it. So what they do is to say, OK, we only roll it back to the previous five words or previous eight words, and then stop there. Okay. All right. So the advantage of recurrent nets is that um, you can think of it as each of these hidden nodes form a very succinct description of your sentence so far. Um, and theoretically, because it's recurrent, so you can keep all the information from the past. So if you say something and something you said a long time ago is actually very important, it will continue to stay in the history. So, so yeah, so I've said this before. So in practice, you actually don't go through all the way back to the beginning of time, but maybe you fix it. And then, yeah. Okay. One, one other interesting thing is there's this byproduct of training. So these weights here can actually be used as word embeddings or representations of words. And that's actually useful for many language processing tasks. So, so at NICE, we actually work a lot on this kind of thing. Okay. So um, maybe I'll give you a example here to make it clear. So this is using Mikolov's um, recurrent neural language model. And I've already trained it on some newspaper and, and uh, speech data. So now I'm just going to generate some words. Right? So can you guys see this okay? So these are the sentences that it generates. So think of it as we start out with some we start out with some ran, um, initial H and then some random words, and then we just compute H and then next word, and we just keep on going indefinitely and see what happens, okay? And these are the sort of sentences that I can generate, right? And if you see it, there's actually s some sense in the sentence, right? These are all random sentences, but, but they kind of look like English, right? The 
problem of u2 by mu2 pa has to be true. That kind of appears to be true. Okay. And you can also look at the, the word embedding is generated. So for example, this is taking the w weights. Okay. So let's say the word red has a set of weights and what's the closest, what are the closest words in that weight space? So you can see that blue, yellow, right, gray. So all these colors are close to the, the word vector for red. So it's kind of learning some sort of semantics or syntax. Other words people want to try. Deep, right, deep, hidden, flat. Maybe there was some sort of deep learning lecture training data that I used. Okay, sorry. <laughs> right. If you say Japan in countries out here, so so. Hmm? Same tissue. All right. That's a hard question. Okay, let's do D four. D four. Wow, this works. Any other words you want to try? This one didn't work well. Yeah, it seems like, I guess there's two senses for flat red. The verb sense or not. Yeah, these two clues might be different. That no, didn't work, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. But basically these are things that are, are learned directly on t raw text data. Okay, so you can see how powerful this kind of recurrent net is. I guess this is not that important, just to show that recurrent nets can do better than the traditional n-gram model. So perplexity is a common thing people use to, um, to measure how good your language model is. So in perplexity, lower number, the better. So you can think of it as how perplex, how perplex you are when you see data. Okay. So basically, if you increase the size of the hidden layer, see some improvements, although the improvement starts to drop to be smaller when you have a too big layer. And then the paper also shows that if you combine neural networks, um, combine sort of three randomly trained neural networks, you can get way better results. And this will actually, when you read a lot of papers, this is sort of a recurrent theme, is that for neural networks, when you combine them, it seems that because every one of them is sort of started from a different random point, you can get better results. Okay. All right, so that's all I want to say about this. Okay, are there any questions? Okay. So if not, let's take a brief three minute break and then we can start the final part.
OK, so let's get started. Um, so I just want to briefly present a set of sort of random topics on how to optimize these sleep architectures in a better way. And there's actually many new things coming out every year at uh, conferences. And um, everyone has some new way to optimize sleep architectures better. So I'll basically pick four things that I think are useful for practitioners. Okay, but please go to these conference proceedings to see other things. Okay, so there's many things out there. But I think these four things, so if you get a rough idea of it, it might help you if you um, try, try deep learning on your own problem. Okay. So one is, first of all, an alternative to SGD. One is a better way to regularize using some, something called dropout. Um, one is how do you scale to large data and um, hyperparameter search. So I think these are four topics that are important. Okay. So I'll sort of go very fast through each of them. Okay. So these are the four papers I'm picking from. Okay. So let's first talk about an alternative to, to SGD called test chain free optimization. Basically the, the problem for stochastic gradient descent is that if you have a loss function that's very curved, um, it has very many valleys, it's actually very hard to optimize, right? So suppose if your loss function looks like this, um, and if you try to go in the steepest descent direction, right, say you're at this point, the steepest descent is actually sort of going, going down this hill, right? So, so when you try and go direct that direction, you might go down and quickly you, you go up and you end up at this point if your learning rate is not set correctly, right? And then you at this point and you try to go down the steeper descent and you end up coming to this point and sort of you, you go back and forth. It takes you a long time, right? So the, way, the only way to solve it is you have a learning rate that's much smaller. So even you go down, you don't come back up right away. So you just go down a little bit and maybe you stay down here and then after you're down here, then you can, then you know actually the, the way to go downward is directly going down here like that. So you'll go s small steps down like this, right? But ideally what we want to do is to say, if we know the curvature of this error function, um, we should be able to know which way to go, right? The best way is to directly right, go, go down like this, right? And that's what second order method or Newton methods will help you do. So when you look at optimization literature, there's a big class of first order optimization methods which only use the gradient information and then a big class of second order methods that also use the curvature or the Hessian information. Okay. So I won't talk about this in a lot of detail just to give an intuition. So the intuition is when you try to optimize this loss function Earlier we said, okay, one way to optimize it is to look at the gradient of that loss function and sort of go along that. And that will sort of make you, help you go down. But another way to do it is to say, we approximate this loss function locally with a quadratic function, okay? So say your loss function is this, and you're currently at point W. And you're trying to decide, okay, what's the direction Z I should go in to, to optimize this loss function? You can write L as a quadratic approximation like this, right? So it's simply the value at W plus the gradient times the whatever direction you're going. And then there's a second term here, which is the Hessian, right? So you can think of it as, as this. So you have some arbitrary function. You want to optimize it. Currently, you're at this point, W. Now, to optimize it, you can say, okay, I'm going to approximate this function at this point using a quadratic. So this quadratic is a parabola, right? So it might look like this. So I approximate this function of a quadratic, okay? And quadratics are nice because they're easy to optimize. So I can quickly go to the bottom of this quadratic. So I could quickly jump here. 
Now, when I jump here, actually, the, the point I'm at is here. So again, we will approximate with a quadratic. Right? In this case, we actually get stuck. But suppose we have something that looks better like this. So now we approximate with a second quadratic. Oh, sorry. Maybe <laughs> let's say that a quadratic looks like this. Right. So then we can jump here, and then we will get also that. So the idea is rather than going gradient, you approximate your function with some other function that's easier to alphabetize. And um, so quadratic is one such function. Now you can actually do the Taylor expansion, and actually there's many more terms here. But this is second order method, okay? So how do you optimize this function? So basically now, we can define this as qz at point w. Now this, so basically we want to optimize q with respect to z. So how do you optimize this? It's actually very simple, right? It's a quadratic. So well, if you take the derivative of this guy with respect to z, right, you actually get, right, take derivative with respect to z, you get this term is out, and you get the square term is out, and then you, you take the inverse. So you actually have this. Right? So the best direction that optimizes this quadratic function is actually is the gradient scaled by the Hessian. So actually, intuitively, this makes a lot of sense. Right? So basically, it means that the best direction is not the gradient direction, but it's the gradient direction scaled by the curvature. Right? So in this case, if you know the curvature, this part is very steep, right? then you will scale it so that it doesn't go that far in that direction. Right? So, so basically, the Hessian comes about as a way to fix, sort of normalize this pathological, pathological curvature. Or another, another way to view it is, suppose you have a contour plot. You have a contour plot like this. If you take the gradient, right, it's actually hard because it's a very narrow valley if actually you have a sort of nice circle, it's not an ellipse, but nice circle. If you take the gradient, you're actually always going in the right direction. Right? So this Hessian sort of scales this so that everything looks nicer, looks like round circles. So the problem with this is that um, Hessian is hard to compute and hard to store, right? If you have one billion variables right, in your neural network, that's a square of one billion, right? So we don't want to store it, and even worse, we don't want to compute the inverse, right? Computing the inverse of the matrix is n cubed. So there's a lot of quasi-Newton methods that sort of do this approximately, and people might know of LBFGS, which tries to approximate this inverse directly with some low rank matrix. Hessian free is another approach, another quasi-Newton approach. Um, basically, it doesn't try to compute this. So it tries to optimize Q directly using something called con conjugate gradient method. And then the Hessian free part means that we actually don't compute H. We don't compute H, we don't compute H inverse, we di directly compute HZ, right? So we directly compute this one. And it comes from the observa observation that you can compute HZ using a finite difference e equation. So HZ actually equals to this equation, right? So you can think of it as you only need another gradient evaluation to compute HZ, right? So evaluating the gradient is way simpler than evaluating the H. So this is a trick that Hessian free method will use. So that's, that's as far as I'll explain about Hessian free method. Basically, you can think of it as we want to use a curvature information, right? So we approximate, we use a Newton method, but rather than computing the Hessian, 
we will have some trick to avoid computing this extensively. Okay, okay. so um, here the results basically say that um, if you use a second order Hessian free optimizer on the deep network with random initialization, it actually gives lower error than using pre-training plus first order optimizer. So that's kind of a nice result, right? So that sort of implies that earlier we said that there's many local optimums in the loss function, and maybe we're getting to a wrong local optimum. But this sort of can imply that actually the local optimum that maybe the SGD is getting is not a true local optimum. Uh, it's a local optimum because the SGD can, is too slow to get out of it. But if you actually run it for a long time, it can get out of it. So it's a different kind of local optimum. And if you have a, a second order method, um, you can actually get, get out of it. Okay. So, so this is kind of an interesting result. And basically, you can think of, earlier we say, okay, it's important to do pre-training to make sure that you get good results. But basically, the new results coming out are saying that but if you have a better optimization method, maybe you can get away with random initialization. So first order means you only use gradient information. Second order means you also use the curvatures. Okay. So yeah, just to give, give you a brief view, you don't need to understand everything fully. Okay, so let's go on. Um, so this is about how to optimize better. Okay. Another issue we need to care about, so it goes back to the question of generalization, right? So regularization is important when you have something that has um, very high expressiveness. So Hinton proposed this interesting idea called dropout. And you can think of it as a way to regularize all of this. It's very, very simple. Okay. So this one slide explains the entire thing. So when you train your network using backpropagation, what you do is you randomly delete the hidden nodes with half probability. So basically, say you try to predict, okay, what's the label of Y given X? You actually randomly sort of delete these nodes. So all these weights going into H1, all the weights going out are just gone. Okay. So the network needs to figure out the answer by the remaining nodes. And you can think of it as you're trying to sample a different architecture, right? Because you're doing this randomly each time. So it's actually sampling from two to the H different architecture. Now at the test time, after you've done training, you actually use all the nodes, right? You don't delete anything. Um, but you actually have the weights because now you're using two times the number of nodes. So it's a, it's a small trick. You just have the weights. It's not exact, but it's okay. And the effect of this is that, um, just does better, okay? Um, and you can view this as reducing overfitting by preventing co-application. So the idea is that suppose, suppose you have this node on, maybe this node and this node will actually always be on at the same time, right? So they're sort of correlated. But if you force one to be off, then this guy needs to make sure that he's good on his own. So they can't work together they have to sort of each one be by themselves be good. And that's a way to, to sort of reduce overfitting. Or you can you view it as model average. Okay. Are there any questions for this? Oh, by random, yeah, yeah, by random. Yeah, so by random, you randomly delete. So 50% chance you delete this node, 50% chance. So you actually delete many things. Okay. But each sample, you, you do it differently, right? So each sample, for a different sample, you actually might delete a different node. So that's the important thing. And 
only do it during training, during testing things like this. Just flip the hat. Delete only during training. So you can think of, you're, you're making it harder to train, right? So every time you see a training sample, if you do standard back propagation, right, you'll quickly learn the best weights that will predict that sample. But now you're just making it hard for yourself and you're saying, okay, I'm gonna randomly delete this so that actually next time it sees a sample, it probably will still get it wrong. So it needs to be robust to your deletion. Maybe I should explain clearly is each sample you get when you compute its output, you randomly delete the noise, okay? And for a different sample, you randomly diff delete different set of noise. Okay, so it's always different subsets that you're using. This is used for back propagation. Yes, exactly. So you got all the way yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's very simple, right? So don't think too too much about it. It's actually just very simple. Okay. So here's the result. Um, the basically these curves are up here. So this is the the classification error on the test set. So lower is better. This is how many um, times you've you've trained. So the, you see these curves up here are the standard procedure. So you just do standard back propagation. And you see is the standard overfitting curve, right? So as you increase, keep on training, you would decrease the error, but on the test set, eventually the error will, will increase. That means you've overfitted. But if you randomly delete stuff, it won't overfit and it just will, will get to a better result. So that's actually pretty nice, right? So that's a very nice way to, to make sure that you don't overfit the data. So, so Hinton argues that um, maybe you don't need a validation set if you have this approach, right? You can just keep on doing it because it won't overfit. Now, there's a lot of research now in trying to analyze why this works, right? What's the theory that makes this simple method work? Okay. Okay, but you'll, you'll see the word drop out a lot now in papers. People So let's move on to um, large scale training. So I have about 10 minutes left. Um, okay, so this is basically how to train on large data. Um, so I've said that deep learning, one reason deep learning is back is because we have large data. Okay. So with large data, we want large models, but it's hard to, to do it if you only have a small machine. Okay. So basically these Google guys propose to to model the parallelism. So first is model parallelism. So you have a big network, right? You either put all this network, the single network on a single machine, but maybe it won't fit on a single machine. So they actually propose to split this network so that it is, lives in different machines. And you also do the processing on different machines. So when you say, when you do a prediction, right? Basically what you need is each single machine will try to compute the hidden values here and then when needed, it will transfer the information to other machines, okay? So that's trying to exploit model parallelism. And you can imagine this sort of distributed processing works if that the connections here are not too often, right? But if you have a fully connected node, maybe there's a trade-off. Okay. So that's one way to, to exploit large machines. Another is data parallelism. So say you have one million samples of data, right? You can actually split them into many small parts and use different machines to compute the gradient, right? So this is one architecture they propose. They call it asynchronous stochastic gradient descent. The idea is quite simple. So if you think of doing stochastic gradient, right? 
you have a current weight vector, and using this current weight vector, you compute the gradient, right? And then you update. So now, what if you have multiple data? If you have multiple data, basically, you can think of each data will compute its own gradient. And then it will update some central weight vector. Okay. So basically, the interesting thing here is that all these machines are running separately. So there's a central parameter server that tells you what's the current weight vector. And they'll tell each one of them. And whenever each one finishes computing a gradient, it'll send it back to the parameter server. And the server will update using the gradient of the equation. Okay. But the interesting thing is this is all asynchronous. So things can be out of order. Right? So this guy could be computing using a W that's sort of old, right? Because these guys haven't updated yet. Okay. But basically the theory turns out that it, it still works. Things still still runs fine. Okay. But this asynchronous aspect is very important because when you have 1,000 computers, right, the probability of one of them failing is very large. Right? Or the, I mean, it, whenever you scale to many number of machines, you always need to consider what if one guy is slow, right? You can't wait for the slowest guy, right? Or what if one guy fails? You can't, you can't reboot him and everyone has to wait for his reboot. So this asynchronous thing says you just go on. You don't care. You just keep on training. And that turns out to be very smart. Here's another architecture um, they use for LPFT. I won't talk about it here. But just to give you the results, um, so the left part um, analyzes model parallelism. So for a single model, how many machines can you put it on? Okay. So here are for different data sets. And this is for training. Right? So basically, the way to look at it is you put the model on one machine or you put the model on 64 machines or 128 machines and you partition the, the weights, okay? And this is the speed up in terms of training that single model, okay? So you can see that for these are, these three are image data sets. So you can, and there are more sparse connection, convolutional interaction. So, so you can see there's some speed up, right? So if you use 64, machines, you can get a five times speed up compared to using only one machine. So, um, I mean, it's not, it's not 64 times speed up, but I mean, it's better than nothing. So you see here for the speech data set, things are more dense, so you actually don't get a nice speed up. So only about eight, if you use eight machines, you can get a nice speed up um, about two times, but that's about it. That's the maximum that you can use. So even putting more machines doesn't help you in that case. Does that make sense? Okay. Now this curve shows data parallelism. So say, say you not only use uh, multiple machines per model, but you also split the data so that each, um, you, uh, each data set gradient is computed separately. Okay. And they, sh they show this interesting curve. So it's always a trade-off between how much time you use to train the system and how many machines, right? These are the two resources you have, machines and time, right? So this, is, um, this point is using a GPU, and it's the time to 16% accuracy. So this is sort of arbitrary, but they say, okay, if I use a GPU machine, so one machine, how long does it take to improve the system until it gets 16% accuracy? and it's about 50 hours on the GPU, single machine. Now, if I use, say, um, the asynchronous SGD, so let's look at this red curve, that's an asynchronous SGD, so I can use up to 1,000 machines there. So if I use 1,000 machines, I can finish training about less than 20 hours. Okay. But if I don't have 1,000 machines, I have 100 machines, maybe I'll finish training in about 40 hours. So this is how to do the thing. So in general, you want, the, you want your method to be sort of as close to this part as possible. Right? And here you see that this um, asynchronous SGD actually does pretty well. Okay. So I recommend you look at the paper more if you're interested in this implementation. Okay. All right, so 
let's just briefly talk about hyperparameter search generators in, in this talk. So as you know, there are many, many hyperparameters, right, in your neural network. So the question is, how do you optimize them? And often, so, so if you really want to do deep learning, I think this is a very important point, is optimizing these might seem like a lot of work, but they're actually very important, right? So if you don't get a good set of parameters, maybe you just can't train this super well. Okay, so it's important to optimize them. So how do you optimize these hyperparameters? The standard way is grid search. So basically, you say, suppose parameter A has 10 different values, you can take on, parameter B has 10 different values, so you just try all 10 times 10 different setups, okay? And just try all of them and see what's best. Okay. Another is random search, right? So you, you just try random values and see what's best. One that I like a lot is what manual search. Sometimes people call it graduate student descent, GSD. <laughs> so basically you, you have a very intelligent graduate student and he will find the best hyperparameter values for you. Okay. So, okay, I mean, I'm, it's kind of joking, but it's actually true, right? So if you look at the best systems, it's basically there's a graduate student working very hard to make sure that it's the best one. There's, there's sort of a new way coming out is to, actually you can treat this search as a machine learning problem itself, right? So your input space is the set of hyperparameters and your output space is the validation error, okay? And you can actually use a machine learning method to try to learn this, to predict, okay, what's the best X, right? So here's the example, right? So basically what we want to do is, because it's expensive to compute, um, the validation error, right? So basically we learn a function that can predict it based on past. And we basically will use this function and then try to find the, the X that will give the lowest point on that function. And then we, we actually run that deep learning model and see what's the actual error we get, right? And that's another point in our data set. Then we can retrain this, this model until, until we're happy. Okay, so that sort of automatic search is, um, is sort of picking up steam and people are trying to see that maybe with so many hyperparameters in deep learning, you can actually use sort of automatic hyperparameter search. Although I would argue graduate student descent is still the best. <laughs> so, so that's all about this class. Um, any final questions before you end? Okay. I hope it was interesting for all of you. And if you want to discuss more about deep learning, you're always welcome to, to stop by my office, okay? All right, so thanks. Okay, so in, if you ask questions and you want credit, please come up and, and write on this sheet.